Thomas A. Dorsey's leadership in gospel music is responsible for the rise of the gospel sound and the legacy carried on by present-day gospel artists. Thomas Andrew Dorsey is the acknowledged father, if not leader, of the early gospel song movement. As a composer, pianist, conductor, and organizer of choirs, his influence on the gospel sound laid the foundation for what we know gospel music to be today. Thomas Dorsey was born in Villa Rica, Georgia on July 1, 1899, to Etta Plant Spencer and Thomas Madison Dorsey. His mother was a church organist and his father was an itinerant Baptist preacher. His first exposure to music was as a child in Mount Prospect Baptist Church, where his parents worshipped from time to time. This is where he heard sacred music, shape note singing, and spirituals, and moaning songs. In 1908, Dorsey's family moved to Atlanta. In Atlanta, Dorsey was exposed to the music by Dr. Watson's early blues and jazz. As a butch boy selling soft drinks and popcorn during intermission in the Nickelodeon movie house, the 81 Theater, he met many live musicians including Ed Butler, a famous silent movie theater pianist. In his active pursuit of music, Dorsey would hang around the live musicians before and after shows, asking them to show him how to play songs on the piano. Dorsey received formal piano lessons from a Mrs. Graves, who had a piano studio near Morehouse College. From Mrs. Graves, he learned to read music and use proper fingering techniques. As a child prodigy, he was able to master several instruments by the time he was a teenager and began playing blues and ragtime. During this time, he also wrote many jazz songs. He even began to substitute for Ed Butler from time to time at the movie house. On August 1, 1925, Thomas Dorsey married Nettie Harper, who he first met while she was rooming at his uncle Joshua Dorsey's house. Nettie Harper accepted Dorsey's proposal for marriage after putting him off for several months to make sure he was the right one. Dorsey was overjoyed when Ma Rainey then hired Nettie as a wardrobe mistress. As a member, Nettie was able to travel on tours with the band. Having his wife near and being able to develop his unique blues and jazz styles for the mother of blues gave Dorsey peace from the conflict and self-doubt that plagued him since he began his professional career. Despite his wife's presence, Dorsey continued to suffer from a number of emotional struggles and personal losses that took a powerful toll on his health. While in Ma Rainey's Wildcat Band, Dorsey noticed an unsteadiness in his hands. It progressively got worse and made him incapable of playing, composing, or arranging music. This led to a deep depression that lasted two years as his condition was incurable. Quote, I knew not where to turn. It was a sad thing to me. It was hard to bear. Nettie took a job in laundry where she spent her days working for one whole year to support us. I was perplexed, sick, disturbed, and a bundle of confusion. End quote. Coming from a religious background, Dorsey, finding himself in such a low place, saw comfort in the church. There, Bishop H.H. H. Haley encouraged Dorsey, and then was reported to have pulled a live serpent out of Dorsey's mouth. This, in a sense, released Dorsey, and from that time on, he claims to have suffered no more. From 1929 on, Dorsey committed himself exclusively to gospel. Then, on August 26, 1932, during a concert, Dorsey received a telegram saying, Hurry home, your wife is sick, she's going to have the baby. When Dorsey arrived back in Chicago, Nettie was already dead. The baby, Thomas Andrew Dorsey Jr., was alive and healthy. But then his newborn son died a few days later. Quote, I entered the Pilgrim Baptist Church and looked down that long aisle which led to the altar where my wife and baby lay in the same casket. I started the walk and the procession, and the aisle grew longer and longer before me. My legs got weak, my knees wouldn't work right, my eyes became blind with a flood of tears. There Nettie lay, cold, unmoving, unspeaking, end quote. After the death of his wife and child, Dorsey was tempted to return to secular blues music as a revenge for God not saving his wife and child. Instead, Dorsey found one of his greatest inspirations, which led to his most famous song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lord. 
gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, and the term gospel comes from the Bible, where the books that speak on the life of Jesus are called the books of the gospel. Dorsey believed that a gospel song was a revelation of a personal experience. Down through the ages, gospel, what? What did they say it was? You mean to tell me you don't know that good news? On down through the ages, gospel was good news. Now, if you don't know that, I'll throw you out here myself. So gospel music is the good news of Jesus Christ in song. And traditionally, gospel music has been traditionally an African-American art form. But now we have um, cultures, all different cultures, singing gospel music. But um, gospel music is the good news of Jesus Christ uh, in song with a birth out of the Negro spirituals, I would say. Mr. Dorsey's being a blues pianist brought a, a blues sound to gospel music. The blues and gospel music have similar setups. The rhythms are very similar, at least the, that which Mr. Dorsey brought to gospel music. The rhythms are similar. Uh, the styles are similar. Um, one of the main differences is that in the blues, the blues is usually 12 bars. Uh, gospel music tends to be 8 or 16. But um, the blues sound gave more of a homey, emotional type of experience uh, to gospel music. Initially, mainstream churches did not accept Dorsey's gospel music because of its apparent secular influence. The religious music that Dorsey proposed at that time called for a drastic departure from the music practices of the large Protestant black churches in Chicago. But in spite of the old line church's objections to the music, the growth of the congregations and the churches that played Dorsey's gospel music convinced other churches to integrate gospel into their services. Along with writing gospel music, Dorsey was also a highly sought-after choir director and organizer in Chicago, which was considered the home of gospel. His first choir was formed at Pilgrim Baptist Church, and he co-founded the first national convention of gospel choirs and choruses. According to the Reverend Augustus A. Evans, assistant under Dorsey at Pilgrim Church, the larger the church, the bigger the choirs, and the greater the demand for good music. Consequently, the churches hired top musicians and paid them good salaries for training their choirs. Mr. Dorsey wasn't, wasn't, he sung, but he wasn't, I don't think singing was his gift. He sang from his heart, um, being a pianist and whatnot, but he knew how to get the best out of singers. And uh, he worked with people like Mahalia Jackson and, and uh, James Cleveland. I think he helped develop their, their styles. Most gospel historians agree that Thomas Dorsey wrote and produced over 1,000 gospel songs, holding the copyrights for approximately 500 of those. Thomas A. Dorsey influenced many people in both life and death. He seemed to have a gift for bringing out the best in soloists and choirs. He had a deep understanding of the African American voice and life experience. He mentored Mahalia Jackson, who was considered the mother of gospel, he worked with Willie Mae Ford Smith, Sally Martin, and the Staple Singers, and many other gospel groups and choirs. All who worked with Dorsey became better because of the experience. Thomas A. Dorsey's creation, leadership, and legacy in gospel music have changed the way people have worshipped God in song for more than half a century. His legacy lives on through the music we hear today. The Lord.